<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, feels like it's been a while since we had a discussion since our last one, but I've been really looking forward to this one because, you know, um, menopause, a lot of it, the struggles for me have been physical ones. And, and they haven't been really decreasing in terms of the levels, such as the hot flashes and the insomnia and um, a couple new things are happening from week to week. And so I was really looking forward to the conversation about the physical part of menopause and, and the hormones and, you know, really reflecting on um, my moon time and, and already missing it um, for a lot of reasons. And mostly because I guess I, I never really realized until now just the profound um, way that it affect your body in a good way, like the hormones that come along with it and keep you sort of balanced as, as, as well as they could, I guess. And you don't really realize that, of course, until you don't have that anymore. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. I, I've been checking out TikTok from time to time. And, you know, sometimes there's people on there who are talking about menopause and some symptoms and a lot of conversations going on all over the place amongst people with uteruses and talking about this part in their life. So I'm, I'm glad to know that I'm not alone. And I think a lot of women are feeling the same way or people are feeling the same way um, because it can feel very isolating. You know, you can really get inside your head about things such as, oh my goodness, now my hair is starting to fall out and then you become really self-conscious or Christy and I were just chatting about how our eyebrows are thinning out and are we going to start coloring them in and you know all of these physical manifestations that can be very hard to deal with so hoping to get some more understanding of the hormones and how all that happens and that might help me reconcile it a little bit more in my mind and hopefully help you as well and start to try to have um, some working knowledge so that you and me can go to our own doctors and have conversations and say, hey, listen, you know, this is what I'm experiencing and how can you help me? Can you help me? You know, things like that. So I just want to say um, thank you for joining today. And I'm really looking forward to our discussion with Dr. Smiley. Thanks, Tanya. So uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to, I believe this is our seventh episode of Notgo Pon Kyogewin. So the old lady has stopped visiting is what that translates to. We've had some really wonderful guests on our, I don't know, we're calling it a show, I guess. I don't know what to call this, <laughs> this webinar series. Um, so far, uh, we've explored a lot of ideas um, and I was really looking forward to this one also because uh, Dr. Janet Smiley is uh, my lodge sister. She's a friend. Uh, we're family in that way. We've been uh, close for in that way for many years through our connection of Maria. But then, you know, our friendship is is strong. And, and I really respect and admire uh, Janet, I'll, I'm not going to say Dr. Smiley, I hope that's okay, <laughs> but <laughs> I really admire my sister because of, of the free and caring way that she approaches her practice as a doctor, um, a medical doctor, and the research that she's done. Um, one of the th reasons why I was looking forward to this as well is because uh, we, I feel like we can just jump into like the nitty gritty of bodily functions. And I, I personally find it really fascinating. And so that's why this episode is all about hormones. We're going to just go into like, what is, what are hor hormones and how does this um, changing hormones in your body, how do changing hormones in your body uh, affect your experience with menopause or could it affect your experience through the menopause transition. So with with me myself, personally, I did not understand that hormones have multiple ways of um, affecting your body in positive ways while you're menstruating. And then as the, the hormone levels change, uh, that this can affect all sorts of things. And that has been completely eye-opening to me. 
And I wish I had have known all of this stuff sooner. So like we do with all of our episodes, we don't uh, do long, lengthy introductions of our guests. We allow them to introduce themselves in the way that they feel comfortable. Um, and it takes that really awkward, you know, ness of reading off people's bios, lengthy bios. So we're going to turn it over to Janet to introduce herself, and then we'll begin the the webinar with with some sort of general questions about. I think the first question we do have, if I'm not mistaken, is what are hormones, and what parts of your body produces them. So we'll turn it over to Janet. Tenzi, Tenzi Italia, I want to greet everybody like in a really good and sacred way. I'm really honored. Um, thank you, um, Kenneth, going to and Christy and Tanya for this inv invitation and for everybody that signed up today. Um, so I'm Janet Smiley. Um, I'm a Métis Cree woman on uh, my mom's side. My uh, family names are Whitford, Sauvé, Spence, and Cardinal. So uh, a Red River and then diaspora into Alberta, intermarrying with some awesome Crees over there. So the treaty lines go back to Papa's Chase. Um, and on my dad's side, the Smileys came from County Down, Ireland. So I have a uh, mixed settler ancestry. Um, and I am a mom of six, grandma of three. Um, I've been in menopause now for about four years. Um, and I had an opportunity um, to train as a medical doctor and then a family doctor. And then I actually did an extra year of training um, in women's health. Um, so I did lots of work um, around menopause. What's interesting is um, I was quite young when I graduated from medical school. I was 24. So one of the jokes is um, we used to say I was Doogie Hauser's half-breed sister. Um, I'll try to make jokes. I just see Tanya and Christy. So if they laugh they'll just encourage me so if the jokes are really bad just try not to laugh at those um but uh I was reflecting and um I think this is aligned with some of the teachings I've had the uh opportunity to hear um but uh yeah I think I thought I knew a lot about menopause before I went through menopause now I've gone through it I don't know how much I really know um but I love her um, bodies. And I love this opportunity. Um, I love speaking in plain language. Um, yeah, so we'll talk about hormones, we'll talk about dry vaginas. Um, and we'll use all those words sometimes when we use words in English, you know, and, and our own languages, um, maybe it brings up um, pain or stigma or fear. Um, but yeah, this is a session where we can just talk about a whole bunch of stuff um, that maybe um, people aren't comfortable talking about and then um, unfortunately sometimes too like um, the care providers that we trust or we want to get the information from um, yeah don't take the time to share it in a good way with us so that's me yeah thanks Janet so uh, we will start off with that question what are hormones yeah and, so I love hormones yeah, and what and what and what parts of the body produces them yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that um, got me um, very interested in reproductive health, attending births, I did that for my first 10 years of practice is like, so hormones are just chemicals. They're natural chemicals in our body, right? Um, so chemicals is kind of a dirty word. I think about it like with pollution and stuff, but I, when I was preparing for the seminar, they're molecules. So they're just made of different elements right but yeah and that's what we call a chemical they're organic chemicals um, and in fact estrogen and progesterone are steroids so we often think about steroids like to build big muscles and testosterone and people with uteruses have testosterone too um, so sometimes uh, that used to get less talked about so what I love about these natural chemicals that are called hormones is they're actually messengers and they travel all around our body. And, you know, you look at one of Christie's paintings and she draws the natural world and the interconnections um, between all things. It's apparent in the pictures. I can't do it justice. You just have to look at her paintings. But it's kind of like that in our bodies too. There's these little messengers 
we have to maybe think of that word in our language. What did we call hormones? Because to me, chemicals is a bit of a contaminated word, um, but they um, are um, big molecules, little molecules, and they travel around our body and they dance with each other, right? Um, and they influence each other. So there's complex interconnections or relationships between these hormones, okay? The hormones um, that have to do with um, menstrual cycle and um, menstruation in people that have uteruses, um, they come from different parts of the body. So right in the middle of our brain, um, there is um, a very older part of our brain, right? That we share then um, with um, some animals that might have less of this newer part of our brain, which is the cortex or the good brain, right? That is supposed to make us think. Maybe that's troublesome, but it's the brain that can make us think. But in this older part of our brain that's been there um, even before we were humans, like uh, it, um, there's um, something called a pituitary gland and a thalamus. So you can look at it. I don't know if some of you have heard like for trauma responses and stuff too, there's a thing called the amygdala, which uh, so our fight or flight reactions are close by there too. Um, and I think that's pretty interesting. I think they're interconnected. So basically there's a hormone cascade um, that, and some of the hormones come from our brain. This pituitary gland makes many hormones, other hormones um, that um, help us with our thyroid function. Um, but there's um, hormones that signal our ovaries for people that have ovaries um, to release eggs. So they send messages down to the ovaries. Estrogen and progesterone for people who have uteruses and ovaries and menstrual cycles, um, are it's mostly made in the ovaries, okay? Um, and then that's why when we go through menopause, we have less, okay? So as part of our moon cycle, it's so amazing, this thing. It's like um, this most amazing and complex art communication, or you could think of a symphony, or you could think of a complex song or play. Um, so in the middle... Uh, to have our menstrual cycle start, a little message comes down from the pituitary gland. It's called luteinizing hormone, and it spikes just as the moon is full, right, and tells us to release an egg, right? Um, and then um, one of those eggs starts growing, 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 and as it grows, it produces estrogen and progesterone. Um, if that egg gets fertilized, um, then it um, grows into the wall like of the womb or the uterus um, and forms a placenta and a growing bean, a fetus. And that placenta creates even more estrogen and progesterone. That's why it's like a super powerful time, right? Um, when you're pregnant. So estrogen is kind of like a power hormone, right? So that's some and I think that our ancestors from all our different nations knew this. Um, so I'm sure that there may have already been teachings about getting in sync with your moon cycle and understanding then um, as that for every moon cycle, there's a little egg um, that is being stimulated, growing, growing, producing more estrogen and progesterone. Um, and that supports the lining of the uterus to get ready for that egg in case it's fertilized to be planted, right? So just before we get our menstrual cycle or our moon time, um, that's when we have the highest levels of estrogen. So I don't know about other people, but I've been told, like, keep track of that. If you have a big meeting that you need to hold, hold it right just before, like, your moon time. That's when you're going to be very powerful, right? And then what happens is it dips. Uh, if we don't... Um, get that egg fertilized. And then um, that menstrual blood, that is like the fertilizer for new life. So it's so powerful. Um, and so we um, lose that fertilizer 
um, in our menstrual blood. I think that's why it's considered so powerful. Um, so there's other hormones that we have, thyroid hormones. In other places, we have um, a thyroid gland that re receives a signal from a thyroid stimulating hormone in the pituitary. Then it tells the thyroid gland to make more thyroid hormone. And then we have adrenal glands, um, which sit on top of our kidneys, and they make a whole bunch of hormones too. Um, and they make a little bit of estrogen. Other places that can make estrogen can be our liver. Um, so I think I answered the question about what are hormones and what they do. I'm, I'm surprised to hear that the liver makes estrogen. <laughs> I would have never guessed that one. <laughs> yeah, um, Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to ask the next question, but if you wanted to do a follow up. No, go ahead. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So in terms of um, how and where hormones are in your body, can you talk about what happens to all that when menopause starts to happen or, you know, when you have menopause? Because I guess for some people, they don't, they, they experience it in other ways. Um, like premature menopause, for example. For sure. So, and we're going to talk about that tomorrow, like, because sometimes if you've had different surgeries or chemotherapy, or sometimes people just go through menopause a bit earlier. But on average, when people are about 51, um, but again, in our own communities, that could vary because it changes according to who we're related to um, a little bit, um, we stop having menstrual cycles. And the reason why it happens is because we run out of eggs in our ovaries, right? So that little messenger from the pituitary gland comes down the um, luteinizing hormone and there's also um, a follicle stimulating hormone. So they um, come down in the first at about day seven to 10, usually of the average 28 day moon cycle. But again, everybody's different. And that's the other thing. I called it like a special dance or I like to think, I do like classical music. So I think about it like that, like a classical orchestra, like communicating with each other, right? But everybody has their own rhythm. There's so many different composers. So each of us is unique and beautiful in terms of how this happens. Just like if we're comparing it to the natural environment, like there's no landscape that's exactly the same, right? Like, so there's no forest that's exactly the same. Right. And it depends a little bit. It depends on other things, probably the soil, the weather, where that is. Um, so what happens is the follicle stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone come down from the pituitary, talk to the ovaries. But <laughs> there's no eggs. We run out of eggs. I always think about the egg carton in the fridge and <laughs> it's empty. Right. So and what can happen is um, so then. Um, those hormones get really high. So that's why some people might have heard of a blood test that could say if you're in menopause or not. Like, so they'll look for this FSH or LH and they go high, right? Because they're like knocking on the door. So the pituitary gland keeps sending that signal, right? Because there's a feedback loop once you start producing estrogen and progesterone, but there's no feedback loop. So what can happen is that's why a lot of um, people with uteruses experience some missed periods first, right? Like, so, um, and again, I'm gonna, I'll just self-disclose and some people might not, but yeah, for me, I think I, you know, all of a sudden I'd miss a month or two or like six months, right? I think I went almost a year um, and then I had another period. And in fact, the way they talk about that, like in the doctor's office in biomedical science, you actually only have one day of menopause, right? And it's actually the day that you went 12 months with no periods, right? Or no moon cycle. And then you're in postmenopause. But there's kind of this perimenopausal time. So sometimes if it's like this amazing classical music, the thing is when we start our menstrual cycles and as we're coming to the end, things aren't quite as harmonized. It's like, um, so I always would describe in my clinical practice, that's like around perimenopause. And some of you that are maybe in your, it can start in your late thirties or forties. It certainly happened for me. Like I would have 
like because basically when we're in our 20s and 30s this menstrual cycle is like this beautiful wave like it's all gentle but then <laughs> as we get closer to menopause it starts like going up and down like a bit more steeply and it's the changes in the hormones right that can um challenge our body a little bit so hot flashes like are resulting from big changes in hormones um another thing like so for myself and again I'm open about the fact that I've um, struggled with depression most of my life it's well managed but I know when I was going through that perimenopause it was even harder to manage right because big changes in our hormones of estrogen and progesterone can wreck havoc a little bit havoc a little bit with our mood that's why some people like with the premenstrual syndrome and stuff it's just a wave I think all the teachings that I've had about like paying attention to your moon what kind of moon cycle it is like that's all really important self-awareness right because it can help us understand kind of where we're at right it's kind of um, just like anything else like how are my feelings today but also how is this moon cycle for me? Cause I need to be aware of that. It's like, so it could be like a big rainy moon cycle or a thunderous moon cycle. It's like changes in the weather, how those hormones are changing. And again, um, that could make us feel happy, energetic or sad. And uh, um, so what happens is once we get to menopause, then um, there's no more eggs left. So then we don't go through that cycle, a monthly cycle of producing estrogen and progesterone that grow the lining of the uterus. And most of the symptoms that we experience then as we're approaching menopause are related um, to the changes in the hormones. It's interesting because I'm really trying to frame menopause as a positive thing. Um, so for me, anyways, and again, um, like I thought, well, I don't have to worry like about these irregular moon cycles. I ended up having a very, very heavy moon cycle, right? I thought, oh, you know, this will make some of our, the protocols, like the energy, I'm quite sensitive. And some of the people in our lodge are quite sensitive to moon time energy. So it's like, oh, I don't even have to worry about this. Or, you know, if one is carrying ceremonial objects that uh, we need to use like in community um, and the energy of moon time is too powerful for those objects to be used by everybody. It's like, oh, I don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, but yeah, we'll get there together in the conversation. But I hope I answered your question, Tanya, about um, what happens then, why we get these symptoms and what happens to our hormones at the time of menopause. We still do have a little bit of estrogen and progesterone, but it's much lower. Okay, I, that's that's a really good. Uh, thank you so much for that. I want to just going off of what you just said, since we since we're into the topic of symptoms before we get into the next question, I think, which was uh, about medical interventions and those kinds of things. Uh, that's a whole other thing that we can get into. But and there's a question, some really good questions that people are are putting in the Q and A, which I think we, you know, if we have the time, we should definitely get into them. But speaking about symptoms in particular, there's one thing that, um, there's not one thing, there's multiple um, symptoms that people are shocked or, uh, you know, uh, curious about if their symptoms are related to the this fluctuation in hormones so the most common symptom that everybody knows about already is hot flashes and when we ask our mothers and our aunties and our grandmas about menopause you know the the typical answer that we'll we'll get is oh i went through a few hot flashes and it didn't bother me too much and that's about it you know and you don't get you don't get this idea of okay uh, Tanya already said before in one of the episodes that she she had frozen shoulder. Uh, I didn't realize that uh, joint uh, stiffness and uh, acne on my face. I didn't realize hair loss. I didn't realize, uh, oh, insomnia. I didn't realize that there was like all of this. There's like a massive list. I understand that some of these things can be explained by other medical um, things or maybe compounded medical issues or compounded uh, health care things, health, health issues of other things that are going on in your body, 
you mentioned the thyroid, for example. But I don't think that I understood how important these hormones are or were <laughs> when I had them in the, <laughs> in the beautiful moon time. <laughs> um, I don't think I really understood just how well they regulated my body and how well they were doing these amazing things for me that I didn't, you know, if I hadn't known that, maybe I would have, you know, in those times that we're in, in ceremony together, maybe I would have said, you know, I just like creator, thank you for my hormones. But I don't think, I don't think I did. I didn't do that because I didn't know how important they were to me. And now not only do I miss my moon time, but I miss my hormones. And I, I really, I guess what I want to do for the people that are listening in and the people that will watch this afterwards is to kind of do a little bit of a grocery list of some of the things that are, that you wouldn't normally associate with this fluctuation in hormones and what that can cause, what that can, you mentioned mood. Uh, I didn't understand that either uh, standing at, at the, at the, what do you call it? The laundry machine, putting my laundry in there and getting angry for no reason. <laughs> Never been angry doing laundry before. And there I was getting angry for no reason. So all these kind of things are, are happening and and people have expressed different symptoms that I don't have uh, like you said everyone's experience is different so let's do a little bit of a grocery list what are the what are the ways in which hormones uh, now fluctuating or dropping can affect uh, a body okay grocery list so the bread and butter of menopause are the hot flashes but your auntie might say a few hot flashes um, but it's different for everybody. And it actually can be quite severe. I think it lasts on average for seven years. Um, if you start getting hot flashes before your periods stop, um, then the idea is it might actually even last a bit longer. Okay. And then, and we'll talk for each of these, there's different things that you can do in different tips. Okay. But the butter that maybe aunties didn't talk about because they were ashamed right, is vaginal dryness, which can cause uncomfortable sex um, and also changes in your bladder function too. Um, and that's just because in addition to estrogen and progesterone growing that very fertile um, lining of the uterus, it's called endometrium. It's like this beautiful, powerful magic soil of life in our uteruses. Um, they help keep our vaginas um, moist um, and um, vascular, right? So um, once we lose estrogen, that can change, okay? And that's, it's interesting. I think I shared, and I think there's been a question about this because this is easily treated too. Um, so um, like there's a lubricant called Replens. And I remember, remember I was a young doctor. I was still a little older. Um, when I um, was doing some women's health clinics in some small communities in northern Saskatchewan. And of course, then I knew we sh should be asking people um, who, with uteruses who were going through change of life about the hot flashes and also about vaginal dryness. And for some reason, there hadn't been a female doctor in some of these Korean Métis communities for a long time. So, and, and, and I was seeing older women who were excited to hear about this. And I kept writing, I said, well, there's lubricants that you can use for that, right? Because if one's like, it can make um, sex really uncomfortable. Um, so there's a lubricant called Replens. I was looking at the non-insured health benefits list. I was grumpy because they don't have one that doesn't have hormones in it. So we've got to have a little thing and say, hey, you got to fund this Replens. But also just any drugstore now, or if you're in a city, there's lots of sex shops and stuff like that any of the lubricants will be really helpful um but the replens one is particularly um formulated for um women going through menopause so it's just a water-based uh lubricant i think that one has a little bit of mineral oil in it too but the rest of the grocery list um includes of course changes in your periods which we already talked about um, the bladder issues, okay, because um, our bladder sits on kind of a hammock or a sling of pelvic muscles, and when the estrogen um, gets low, 
um, that pelvic floor can relax. And again, there's that's why we do all these Kegel exercises and pelvic floor exercises. They do work. Um, if people with uteruses have had children pass through that pelvic floor, then of course, um, that elastic pelvic floor is going to be a little stretch here too. So maybe having to get up in the night. So this is where it really impacts sleep, right? Because then you're having hot flashes. And the common sense stuff around sleep is just to dress in layers, try to wear absorbent cotton clothes, try to um, make sure you're not going to overheat at night. Um, but then you have the hot flash, you're already having not as uh, Okay. Okay, so, so we can continue. We'll continue. Okay, so just after we talked about the hot flashes, we talked about the dry vaginas, we talked about um, like bladder problems, like in losing urine, sometimes maybe if you cough or laugh because that pelvic floor... Um, is a little bit more relaxed. And then we talked about how all of these things in addition just to menopause can impair our sleep um, and that can affect our mood. So then I was kind of moving because it's supposed to be a grocery list. This is the secret part of the grocery list that you don't <laughs> even, didn't even know you needed it. Um, so that estrogen helps keep our bones strong. And for all of these things, again, I'm all into trying to think positively like about this powerful change time, a time where women come in to their power, right? Um, so I was thinking, I never really saw my aunties or my grandma, they're still running around. Like, so the other thing we can do for the bone loss is to stay physically active and do weight bearing activities. So not all of us um, can do that because some of us might have mobility things. Um, joint pain is certainly visible and that's that can be influenced by men of, pause. Um, and again, as I mentioned, like we talked about like the eco cycle of like the reproductive hormones in people with uteruses, but there's five, six, seven, eight, nine other complex eco cycles, right? So most of the things that are impacted by our hormones and going through the change of life, for sure, they're interacting with other things too right? So that's, say for me, I already had some issues with depression. And then, um, like, I had to be more aware for that part of my cycle. So again, with this stuff around, you know, a frozen shoulder or very sore joints, maybe somebody's already having some issues, but then menopause um, can accentuate those issues, the change of life, right? We miss the hormones even more. Um, and then another thing that can happen is um, estrogen and progesterone, those hormones are complicated too in terms of how they um, help us maintain our heart health, our cardiovascular health, because estrogen is actually sticky, right? Because if we're sad about losing these hormones, why don't we just take them? They're available in pill form. Um, but in fact, um, one of the challenges is um, they can stimulate um, breast growth, which can be good, you know, if you want to um, breast or chest feed a child, right? But not good if you have a history or you're predisposed in your family to breast cancer. We know that um, women overall in mainstream, not in our um, First Nations and Métis communities, because we have other um, embodiments of um, multi-generational colonial trauma going on, um, but that usually men have um, earlier onset in the general population, whatever that is, um, men tend to have heart attacks at an earlier age than women. Um, but then we catch up with them. We catch up with them once we go through menopause. So something is happening there with estrogen that's protecting our hearts, even though when we try to take it, um, there was a big study um, that showed that it actually, it's a bit sticky. So sticky things are not good, sticky biochemicals, because they can actually cause blockages. Um, so some of you, I know in my medical career, and if you talk to, you might be aware that maybe um, some of your older aunties um, would have been put on hormone replacement therapy. And some of you might be on hormone replacement therapy, and it can really help with symptoms 
of menopause. It can help with the hot flashes. It could be an important thing to do. Um, and it's good to talk to your primary health care provider. That's why you need an even longer conversation. Um, but if you're going to be doing that, we now actually have to do a bit of a heart health and cardiovascular health check, which you should be having at this time anyways, when I was in very busy family practice, because it's a change of life, it was always a time to kind of review things. I'd like to think, you know, some of the depression too, definitely the hormones impact, but that's part of, um, I also think it's a change of lifetime um, for women as well, um, and people with uteruses, and um, depending on um, where you are in that cycle, figuring out how to embrace our power of, as women, but you know, maybe kids or grandkids that you've been um, caring for are big and out of the house. So, you know, what's your role? And of course, in um, like Euro colonial um, understandings of womanhood, um, yeah, we lost some of our youth, youth um, when we went through the menopause. So that's always hard for me to get my brain around. I just can't, um, I've um, got too many aunties and my mom and my grandma, my older sister, it's hard for me to imagine women becoming less powerful once they've gone through the change. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I was wondering about, um, so you mentioned heart health, which is which is great. It's a good, good point to mention that because at this age, then if we catch up uh, in terms of risk, uh, to heart disease and whatnot, uh, then we then we need to know that, I guess, so that we can, if we choose, make uh, choices that might be a little bit healthier for our hearts. Um, I know our we have an increased risk to osteoporosis, but what I really wanted to ask about also was the was what about for people who are diabetic? You know, um, how does it, does do hormones have an effect or how does menopause tie into uh, people who also have diabetes? What are the things that they might need to look out for? Sure. So I'll do a little bit more searching on this um, so I can maybe add to my answer tomorrow. Um, one thing that's interesting is um, our, we do have, um, an interaction. So the whole um, complex ecosystem around the hormones, um, including insulin and many other hormones that um, manage our sugars, right, that gets out of whack um, with uh, diabetes. Um, there's all kinds of receptors, including receptors in the uterus. Um, so that can be why um, actually um, having um, diabetes that's not well controlled actually can affect menstrual cycles. Um, I would have to look um, to see if there's any evidence that having diabetes actually would cause menopause to happen sooner. Um, I would say that um, certainly diabetes affects our big and small blood vessels. So the best thing we can do is to try if we are able um, to, um, and, and if we have the support that we need, um, hopefully from a good primary health care provider, which are very short supply for everybody now. But, you know, for example, in Toronto right now, there's like 17,000 First Nations Inuit and Métis that don't even have a regular primary health care provider. Um, you know, I've met people that haven't seen a doctor for two years with their diabetes. Um, but anyways, it's good. It would be important to try at the time of menopause to pay attention. It's just a time, it's another life transition, right? So I like to think about that, you know, we, we've learned to pay attention again and support our youth when they're doing their rites of passage, right? And um, they're getting hormone changes and people with uteruses are starting a menstrual cycle and we pay attention. There's a one-year berry fast, right? So we're going we attend and maybe a little stock have the nice conversations. And it's interesting what things that you're training at the National Health in 1996, they used to have a program Health Watch. And it's specifically going through the age of life. And we'd spend an hour or two with them um, just to go through everything and, and to do a little stock take. So maybe we need to do that again. 
I wanted to ask a little bit more about um, some of the symptoms, I guess. There's some um, interesting questions in the q and I don't know if you're able to look at them. But yeah, um, I one of the questions that I thought was really interesting was if there might be a connection between um, menopause and the hormones changing to getting new allergies. Like, I'm, I'm wondering though, like there's so many variables and how people experience menopause. So it, it, even in our own research, looking around for information on menopause and experiences, it's extremely difficult to find a lot of information. So I, I guess I'm just, uh, I, I know that there might not be an answer to that and to a lot of things, but just to put it out there, if you had heard of any connection between new allergies later in your life to your body changing in the hormones. Yeah, sure. So, and I'll go look to see, cause um, as you know, um, I'm a researcher too down that. So I'll go see what uh, has been written on that. Um, at any time, I think with all of the climate change and then the, all the different kinds of exposures, we would just think about um, inflammation of our systems. That, that's a whole other complicated, beautiful cascade, right? Like the allergy system that gets overstimulated. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised, right? Because menopause is a time of change, right? We're actually reorchestrating a major system in the body, right? So, um, but I, I will double check on that one. Another thing that I wanted to mention too that um, is in, is hidden sometimes and people don't talk about is memory changes and cognitive mm -hmm. changes, right? And again, um, I think um, I know for myself, like my day job, I'm supposed to like get hard when I can't remember people's last names and stuff like that. And um, it's interesting because I you look at that very little written about that but again it's a transition so I try to think about neuroplasticity fortunately I get to be surrounded with a whole bunch of people that are still very sharp in terms of their memory and their cognition and then I think well maybe I have a little bit of experience and or pattern recognition or um, learn some stuff the hard way um, that makes me still useful um, and I also like to think and be curious and this is like how did we traditionally historically build in supports but we should certainly talk about it. And there's a whole bunch of tricks you can do with memory too. And one of the things somebody told me because um, is uh, just wait for a minute, wait for a minute. If you can clear your head enough and wait, often the thing that you can't remember that last name or that word. Um, for me, I get worried too, because I am got a lot of irons in the fire. So I'm not talking as much in medical ease. Um, so then sometimes I can't remember the word. But I'll, I'll follow up on the allergies. And I see some really good questions. So I'd be happy to try to run through those if you want. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe we can start with the one that, because we talked about, just to pick up on the idea of the lube. I know when you told me that story about when you were going up, uh, doing some work with some some of the Northern communities, you know, and then there was a, you know, the, the, there was a, you know, a, a run on lube. <laughs> yeah, I liked it. The pharmacist, because I called the pharmacist and I just said, Do you have a cleanse? And I just write it like a lot of times, um, like I just have a little sticky note in my office. So I'd write replens and just take this to the pharmacist. And it made me um I felt passionate about it, but also like uh, a bit angry on behalf of people because they'd been having a discomfort for a long time and no one had talked to them. Right. So they were looking forward to a little bit of a relief. <laughs> um, there's a question about uh, uh, menopause or perimenopause and orgasm. So uh, one of the people who had written in there said that having, you know, reaching orgasm hasn't been easy. So what can we do to bring back the vascular health to the vagina so that sensitivity comes back is the question. Yeah, so that's a great question. And those are so it can um, affect our quality of life, our sexuality, our sexual function, self image. So including um, our libido, and also our actual ability to have orgasm. So that one, I mean, there are um, 
like hormone solutions. And the other thing that's not always talked about in hormone replacement, but I remember um, like uh, one gynecologist I worked with, she was actually creating some hormone replacements that included testosterone as well, because um, people with uteruses do have natural testosterone, right? Like, uh, and uh, that decreases as well during menopause. Um, and that um, adding that to a gel, right? Like uh, can be helpful. Um, so there are like, you could go see your primary care provider and talk to them. So, um, and get a gel that you could apply vaginally, right? Um, and then the idea is that wouldn't get into the rest of your system as much, right? Though our vaginas are quite vascular, right? But you would be um, treating yourself more locally. Um, and But you would have to do that by going through the kind of risk assessment for like cardiovascular disease. Other than that, using lubricants like Replens um, can help a little bit. So you could try that because it's complicated because if you're just dry and sore, right? Um, and um, sex is becoming painful. Um, but um, then that's also going to get you into a negative feedback loop. Um, so um, those would be the kinds of things like I would be thinking about doing, um, as well as um, maybe just having to change the activities and the level of stimulation. So the first thing is to make sure that um, any discomfort or dryness is dealt with. Another thing that can happen too is we can get kind of chronic yeast infections. Yeast loves actually warm, moist, and dry environments. So if there's any discomfort at all, try to get that um, managed. Um, and then, yeah, if you were concerned, um, talk to a primary care provider and, and consider a hormone replacement gel if um, that fit like uh, with your way of thinking about your body. Um, and also, um, if it fit with um, like uh, your health profile, including your heart health. And then with hormones, there's some absolute contraindications, like any history of um, breast cancer, um, for example, in yourself. Or um, I have um, almost every um, female relative, my mom's age and older, has had breast cancer. So, yeah, I'm not a good candidate for hormones, for example. So, Hmm. but um, just opening up the conversation about sex we could have a whole webinar about that and just talking about how even as we go through this time and that's what's so awesome about humans is we are so diverse I can remember when I was young and thought I knew a lot um in my family practice I'd ask everybody that came in for their um well woman care or well people with uterus care um, regardless of their age, so it'd be people in their 80s, like, um, did they have any new sexual partners, right? Like, and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes they kind of laugh at me. Um, so in general, um, our sexual desires change, right? Um, a little bit um, um, in our needs. Um, but yeah, we're still sexual beings. It's interesting, because I think, um, Tanya, when your mom was talking in the first webinar, didn't she talk a little bit about like two stages two or something like that one where like um, I thought there was something about that, but um, it's important to remember we're still sexual beings. So thank you for the question. Hmm. Um, I have a question about also uh, just uh, I remember just a short little chapter i don't quite remember the details in the menopause manifesto where dr jen gunter talks about trauma and how that can affect the menopause experience or transition and then the, melody has a question could you comment on anxiety depression i'm 52 and in perimenopause a lot of repressed trauma has surfaced in the past year. And do you hear this from others? So the, I know that when we were speaking with Doreen Day, who's a, who's a midwife, um, she was, she had mentioned at another time when I had visited her about how uh, birth experience can be different for people who have experienced trauma. And I won't go into the details of that, but we can figure out how, you know, we can figure out what that means. And, uh, and then so I'm wondering if 
um, it also can experience the menopause transition? And if so, in what ways does it? Yeah, so for sure, everything's interconnected. I was interested to see, and I think I mentioned earlier when I was looking at my, reminding myself about my anatomy, because uh, it's been a little while since I went to med school and I wanted to do a good talk. Um, so that amygdala, which is a place where we can store trauma, like our fight or flight kind of memory center, um, is wrapped right around the hypothalamus and the pituitary, right? Like, which is changing. Um, so I think that any time that we're going through these big changes, so as you mentioned, um, Christian pregnancy and birth and clearly in birthing too, if people have experienced, um, like our body has physical memories. So, you know, if you've experienced sexual abuse um, and again, um, yeah, just stay grounded if you're here or troubled. Um, but uh, um, then having a baby is going to um, possibly be a trigger, right? So again, if we're um, going through the change of life, the first thing is just if we have depression or anxiety, and I always talk about those as flip sides of the same coin, and they're not well managed, then we're more likely to get breakthrough complex trauma symptoms, right? Um, and then we're going through the change of life, right? So it is a time for a stock taker or a reflection. We may or may not be taking it. So maybe there's a reason that we're then finally, we're, you know, um, being able to access more memories or um, they're coming to us. Um, so I could think of a couple of reasons why people might um, be having more triggers or um, be feeling more intense um, memories about trauma. Um, one is just the physical changes that we just talked about, um, which um, could be a trigger. One is just if our mood is up and down. So as I mentioned, my mood swings were terrible. I get really grumpy when my depression isn't well treated, right? Um, but, um, you know, having worked with midwives for a long time to kind of see some of the clients that were struggling with mood when your depression or anxiety is um like uh um raising its uh profile right um then unfortunately too we're more likely we have a lower threshold for triggers around complex trauma so um that could be another reason um, and then a third reason is um, like if this is just a big life event, a big life change, you know, and again, we can look around and maybe we've heard other teachings um, like about how then that might be a time to reflect. But I always just think that um, or to do a stock take. And I mean, I guess if we um, we are trying to decolonize and um, like uh, rekindle um, reweave like our own traditional teachings around menopause, right? But, you know, if part of like colonial thinking around menopause, it's like, oh, now these people are just useless people, right? And fortunately, as I mentioned, that's really hard for me to imagine. But even with our bodies, though, our bodies are changing. That one I've had a harder time with. Um, then uh, that could um, also then um, bring up feelings of inadequacy or remind us of times when we felt our our bodies um maybe somebody was making us feel that we weren't a good person so these days I blame menopause for everything <laughs> everything that's going on in my life I'm like oh it's that menopause geez <laughs> um, yeah. but I want to get to the point where I'm blaming it for everything good in my life so I'm I'm doing exactly. that work and you know thinking about how to shift my thinking around that um a couple of things um again I don't know if there's been any research around these two um things around menopause. One of them is, um, are you aware of any studies or any links between people who've taken birth control and how that might impact the severity of their symptoms once they get to menopause? And the other is for people who haven't had any children in their bodies and, and how do, do they 
experience menopause similarly or or to the um extreme like maybe having super bad hot flashes or not having them i know when maria is talking about her experience she's like oh yeah had a few hot flashes maybe and and that was it and then meanwhile other people are on the other side of the spectrum and just really suffering through their menopause experience so are you do you have any information or um know of any research or anything around those two yeah so one thing that's important too that might not get talked about is it's important to actually use contraception right when you're perimenopausal right because so we all have um so we know the stories of the surprise baby. So if you don't want to have any surprise <laughs> babies, I had my twins the, a month before I turned 40 and yeah, you can't see properly to cut their fingernails anymore and stuff like that. <laughs> but um, yeah, so remember that you, the eggs are still coming. You have to wait one whole year with no period, right? Um, So I, I'll look um, but I, um, like oral contraceptives so often, actually, when you're perimenopausal, a low dose or progesterone only oral contraceptive is one of the ways that you could treat it, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's cyclical hormones and it would help you stay regular, right? And um, it works for contraception. The hormones that we take for menopause are actually way lower in dose though. So they're safer. Um, you know, so if you have some uh, heart health issues. Um, some of you will know um, if you are um, somebody that smokes commercial tobacco. And again, no judgment, right? Judgment doesn't help anybody change that behavior. Um, but yeah, people are saying, oh, I'm 35 now and they won't prescribe me the pill. Um, there's no research that I'm aware of that taking the pill versus not taking the pill makes menopause more severe or less um, severe. And I'll double check. Most of the time, those hormones get broken down. So um, once we go off oral contraceptives, then our body starts producing um, its own estrogen um, and progesterone and, and luteinizing hormone again. Okay. Okay, I see... Um that there are some, I didn't, I, when I got bumped off of this from my webs, from my Wi-Fi, uh, I, I missed the first eight questions. So I think I'll just uh, ask Tanya to maybe go back and revisit um, some of those questions from the first eight to make sure that we covered uh, the majority of those before we jump into the next ones. Okay, so maybe um, <clears throat> what we can do is I'll just, uh, we have less, just um, about a half an hour left, and we still would like to talk about uh, maybe a little bit more in depth about treatments or how to manage the symptoms of menopause. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave those questions for now that relate to that. Um, I'll put those on hold for a minute and maybe those will be answered, but I will go to just a couple of more questions uh, around symptoms. So there's a one question here up from Diana who says she tried hormone replacement therapy um, and it gave her a huge intoler intolerable spike in anxiety. So she stopped because she felt paranoid. Um, would that happen if she took the hormones through a patch or a cream? And, and do you have any insight as to why that affected her body the way that it did? Yeah, so great question. Um, there um, is like um, the Baskin Robbins of hormone therapy or pharmaceutical companies have um, guaranteed that. So um, if you're experiencing like um, disruption of your life, um, it is worth going back to your primary care provider, right? And trying something different in a patch could be a steadier state, right? Remember estrogen and progesterone, if you have a uterus, um, then they will want you to take progesterone with the estrogen. Progesterone can be um, a hormone that can make us a little bit moodier, right? Like it's, if you take it on its own sometimes and you're prone to depression or anxiety, it can be a bit of a downer. Um, estrogens generally like the power, like energy hormones. So, um, but they come in different forms. 
Um, so yes, I would encourage you if you're still having symptoms. So the reason why the anxiety got worse is because something in that hormone formulation um, didn't work very well in your symphony of hormones, right? Um, so going back to a trusted primary care provider and saying, um, this is what happened. Um, and unfortunately, we don't all have trusted um, providers. But what I would do, even when I was ever prescribing any hormones, oral contraceptives, hormones, is like there's a whole um, list of choices. And um, then you can try to match it and you can um, actually look at, OK, for somebody that had anxiety on these hormones, is there another formulation? The other thing that could happen is there's other medicines that can work for um, uh, the hot flashes. So actually there's some non-hormone choices um, for hot flashes. In addition to doing all the things like, yeah, trying to have a fan or keep your um, window open at night and like try not to have too much covers. I used to love to bundle up in covers, um, but now I just wear light clothes and layers. Um, but, uh, there's some other medicines, um, and in fact, some of the medicines in the antidepressant family, um, can also help with hot flashes. Um, so in a low dose, and again, not everybody likes to take medicines, but that's another thing that you could do. Okay. So another question, um, is going back a little bit more to the dry vagina um this person says thank you for all the sacred space and information i have been in menopause for about seven years it started early right after i had a full hysterectomy i'm 54 now and i cannot have vaginal intercourse anymore it is too painful even with high-end lubrication i don't really want to take the vaginal hormones as my doctor has advised is that even safe or are there other ways to approach this Yeah, so um, those are the main ways um, that I know, um, like the vaginal lubricants, like Replens is the one that is formulated, especially for dry vaginas or the, like the hormones that are applied topically in the vagina um, or orally. Um, so yeah, I don't know of any other remedies. I know online and stuff that, because you can go and people will give you these um, um, different kinds of like bio matched hormones and things like that. Um, I'm not aware that they're any better than anything else. And I think they're quite expensive. Um, so I think um, that um, like, we were still sexual beings, right? So this is why I think we might need to even have a whole new conversation or bring in even their sex specialists, right? That would be cool. Let's bring in a menopausal sex specialist and ask them this question too, right? And that would be just a cool conversation because they, like when I try to talk about sex, I always just try to talk about it in plain language and get people information. So um, and I'll go do a little bit more research and see if I can find anything else because not giving up on the idea that uh, this person is a sexual being and, and would like to um, enjoy yeah. that. So maybe we can um, put the Q&A aside just for a bit so we can make sure to get um, some good information on treatments or remedies or how to how to manage symptoms and suggestions yeah sure and then um what we can do even is screenshot and depending on it's funny because i always feel like i'm on a game show or something like this on this i'm it's supposed to be a conversation but i'm like oh snappers okay i'm gonna go really fast because um, and of course that's there's 18 questions um, <laughs> So, uh, like, I have to answer them all quickly. <laughs> I can win a prize. <laughs> um, so, uh, basically, um, for treatments, I think I've gone through some of them um, as we've gone. So, for the hot flashes, like, and again, these are all things that 
um, like, cause I actually, I went back to school and took a course to see what the gynecologists were saying about menopause treatments, just so I could try to be a good resource. Um, and I'll, I'm going to keep trying to develop my knowledge in this area. Um, but yeah, cold showers, decreased room temperature, dress in layers. They say avoid alcohol and spicy foods. Sometimes doctors are so terrible. It's like everything good in life, everything good in life pretty well causes reflux, right? Like I used to say that to people, peppermints, coffee, like you just have to like eat, eat, eat dry gruel. I'm just joking and you won't get reflux. Okay, I'm sorry. Acupuncture, fans, um, cotton and moisture wicking clothes. Somebody, maybe we should find out like is hide really good? Is hide good for moisture or like... Uh, Maybe we all need to um, sleep in seal skin or something like that, right? Um, or beaver pelt. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it does, um, of course, um, as we gain, because another part that doesn't help with the hot flashes is um, our metabolism changes too as we get into menopause. So I certainly have uh, quite a bit more insulation than I did before too. But yeah, again, um, yeah, that's part of it. And um, yeah, I think uh, that's a complicated area. Um, and then there is um, hormones that can be taken. Um, and we've talked about that too. Um, and that can help with the hot flashes. It can also um, help with the other symptoms of menopause. Um, and like I said, if you have a uterus, they'll want to put you on a combination of estrogen and progesterone um, or um, some other um uh uterus lining protective agent because if you just take estrogen on its own it can cause the lining of the uterus to um grow a little bit extra hypertrophy we get extra growth um so some of us lose our eyebrows some people get more hairy like uh, with uh, menopause um uh and uh the hormones come in pills patches and creams um, so we've already heard about those. Um, and then you can take, so there's a form of antidepressants called, um, serotonergic, um, reuptake, um, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the SSRIs, um, and some of the brand names of those that can help are Effexor, Paxil, and Ciprolex. Um, there's a blood pressure medicine called clonidine. Um, it works on, um, helping the blood vessels become less elastic, keeps them steady state because the hot flash, the hot flash starts right in the middle of our brain. It's a big signal. Um, and then our temperature, it's amazing. Imagine if we could harness the power like of the hot flash, right? Like, uh, and uh, so it starts in our center core. Um, and then um, actually it goes when we get like a big, when our center core is too hot, to protect ourselves because our bodies are amazing. That's another big orchestra on our bodies to keep our body temperature at a certain state. Apparently it's really good that it's at that because then um, uh, mold can't grow in us, right? Like uh, fungus. So that's all the zombie movies are about like um, the fungus <laughs> gets smart and so we have to stay a bit hot. So just think. It's protective. We can't get invaded by fungus. Maybe that's the thing. Um, and because uh, uh, yeah, in all those movies about the zombies, like that are based on um, fungus growing in us, we can say, oh, we're in menopause. Where's all the menopausal women that didn't get infected because they were hotter, <laughs> right? But um, anyways, and then the sweating comes. That's just a natural protective thing. But then you get cold sometimes after. And uh, those of you that have experienced it, you really do just feel like ripping all your clothes off sometimes. It can be quite intense. There's some other meds that are for chronic pain. And I'm not endorsing any of these medicines, but to me, um, it's all about choices. So I hope I don't sound like I'm uh, um, pushing them. But um, some medicines people might be aware of called gabapentin um, or um pregabalin, those are used, they're seizure meds that can be used for chronic pain and they're not addictive and they can also help um, with um, hot flashes. So that is a lot of things we can do for hot flashes. Maybe you know um, we, if we harness the power of the hot flashes, like that'd be the ultimate geothermal, 
right? Then we wouldn't um, <laughs> get rid of all that um, oil industry. <laughs> <laughs> that would be cool. One thing that I find peculiar about my hot flashes is um, I'm, I'm able to pattern them now. I can, I can, I know when they're going to happen. I like, it's just this really strange thing. It's become my new cycling instead of having my menstrual cycle regularly and knowing when it's coming in the triggers, I can do it with my hot flashes. But the one thing that I find really peculiar for myself is that I, I'm thinking that my hot flashes release both um, a, a, hist a, a histamine, I think it's called, and um, adrenaline. Because after I have the hot flashes, it really, my nose, my nasal passages just like open up, like I can breathe, like the best I can ever breathe. And I'm wide awake because they happen in the night. So when they happen, I'm like, bling, like wide awake. Like I could get up and go clean my house from top to bottom. It's like the weirdest thing. <laughs> A side That's effect cool. I never expected. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, there's a question here that I thought was uh, specific and interesting, which is, will postmenopause cure my autoimmune immune pro progesterone dermatitis? I don't know the answer to that, but I know you will have less progesterone. Um, so um, yeah, you could, I don't know if you have a good um, care provider that's helping you with your autoimmune um, progesterone dermatitis, um, but I hope it will. Sometimes people get better from their migraine headaches, right? Like uh, um, sometimes like uh, there's, I've seen lots of people in my practice that just got these very, very heavy periods. And of course I talked about that um, for myself. And so then I was like, oh, I'm glad I don't have those anymore because that's tiring and can cause anemia. The, um, the, uh, replens that you that you recommended I've I read in that book um, the menopause manifesto and then also uh, Gail here mentioned that her naturopath recommended coconut oil and it works quite well for her um, and, for them. and I read that also in the um, in the menopause manifesto so what is what is replens uh, you said that it's specifically for vaginal dryness and how would, uh, is, is it different or does it have other things in it besides coconut oil that would, you know, that would help? It has mineral oil in it, Christy, but if coconut oil is cheaper, that's what I was looking at because it's just packaged up in a box, right? Um, I looked at the ingredients. It's mostly just like soothing, moisturizing ingredients. Like there's about eight different ingredients. So like uh, coconut oil will be cheaper because that's then I went to the non-insured health benefits website because I think it costs like uh, like 18 bucks or whatever. It looked like 15 to 18. So um, yeah, I would um, like uh, think about, I just think it's probably got a little bit more than just the usual sex lubricants, right? Which all like, uh, um, and I did notice it had mineral oil in it. Mm -hmm. So Okay, well, we we've covered uh, a lot of the questions. I think um, there there were a lot of sort of more specific ones, uh, like if one has lived with polycystic ovaries, how does menopause affect or change symptoms? Um, so, um, and again, I'll confirm this for tomorrow, but I think it will reduce the symptoms, right? Um, because uh, if with polycystic ovaries, um, like uh, one of the things about polycystic ovaries is you don't get periods, right? But um, yeah, um, you won't be having cysts in your ovaries because the cysts in the as the cysts in the ovaries are are coming um, from uh, ovary that are stimulated by estrogen and progesterone. So I don't know what other, like, uh, I think it can also just affect and interact um, with our um, glucose metabolism and those kinds of things. Um, so. Somebody asked, somebody told me that estrogen is stored in my belly fat. And as I lose weight, I'm more prone to hot flashes. Is that true? 
Um, estrogen doesn't last that long in the body. Um, yes, um, like uh, fat tissue can generate estrogen. It's a steroid, um, like testosterone. So, um, but yeah, I'm not sure about that. I don't know who told you that. And hopefully like, um, it's never great to lose weight that quickly. So yeah, I um, don't necessarily think that if one was losing weight, you actually, your hot flashes could get a bit better because you have less insulation to get so hot. So the heat can escape even more. I was wondering, Tanya, because it said, um, if you know when you're going to get your hot flashes, I was wondering, like, if you have like a little ice pack or something like that, that you can put on your neck or have a cold shower, if you could interrupt them. So, yeah, no, I just suffer through them. But I know they're coming, yeah, but, but I was not make them any easier. It did say that cold showers helps, right? So if you know they're coming, so, but I don't know. Yeah, the thing from my own experience is I get the chills really bad after. Yeah. So that's why I'm hesitant to try like cold things because I, I feel I can deal with the heat better than I can the cold. <laughs> You're like me, I love heat, except that the worst part of the hot flashes was a bit overwhelming. So I have a question on um, hormone uh, therapy. Uh, is that so for example when um before i knew like my experiences with symptoms have gotten worse the further i have gotten away from menopause day one so in my post menopause it's gotten worse and i'm not planning on taking hormone therapy i'm not but but i'm wondering if there's a window in which hormone therapy is optimum for people to take? Uh, is it perimenopause? Is it through, is it menopause and then postmenopause? Is there, you know, a five-year window, a 10-year window? Is there a time when, when perhaps uh, hormone therapy should not be considered? Uh, is there a time at which it should definitely be stopped? Yeah, so it all depends a little bit on your risk profile. Um, if we ask people in their 80s, most of them wouldn't be having hot flashes anymore. Um, so it's kind of like, um, I didn't used to say this too much to patients, because, but like um, when people are thinking they're never going to be able to sleep through the night, I'd be, well, wait until your kid's about 15. They'll want to sleep with somebody, but it won't be you, right? Like, uh, so yeah, I think um, that on average, the hot flashes can last for seven years. If you get them before you go through menopause, they might last a little longer. I think that if they're really disrupting your life, right, one could look and again, Christy, there's other things one could try to, right? Like, uh, so um, for people that didn't want to take hormones, um, I used to sometimes look at like a temporary use of an SSRI again, but not everybody wants to take anything um, pharmaceutical. Um, but I think that um, if the symptoms are severe and disrupting your life, um, you deserve to have the choices, right? I do think that as we age, um, we get a couple, um, the, the scale of our cardiovascular risk increases a little bit, right? But if you're otherwise um, healthy and you don't, you can, so it's an individualized decision scale, right? So, so there's right. no, yeah. So I would think that, um, and so most people will not have hot flashes. Like, uh, I think the, the long end is like 12 or 13 years, right? Beyond hot flashes though, what are the benefits of taking hormonal therapy? Like what, um, I mean, not for hot flashes, but for other reasons, why would people, uh, be offered by their healthcare prof uh, professionals or healthcare providers, uh, or why would they be interested in taking taking hormonal therapy? People that might um, have um, like already problems with thin thinning of the bones or osteoporosis, right? Um, though there may be better options that are safer, because one of the things they have been able to do, um, it turns out that there's estrogen and progesterone, but the receptors in our bones and in our uteruses and in our ovaries um, 
like are really complicated. Like there's not just one estrogen in progesterone receptor. So then they were able to make um, molecules that would um, be very specific. There's six or seven or eight. It's much more complicated than when I went to medical school. So they'll just ping some of the receptors and not others. And then you can um, have different impacts from that. Um, so the um, it's really about, to me, quality of life and then making an individualized decision that fits with your worldviews and your beliefs and your trusts. So other things like um, if, so there's the hot flashes, but remember then that's connected to the vaginal dryness, right? Um, and uh, the um, like bladder issues and um, just general insomnia, right? So um, I think that, like the two things that bother people the most, right? Like our, like vaginal discomfort, irritation, um, and bladder problems and the hot flashes. Um, but the other reasons for taking them could be to um, slow um, bone loss, but there's other medicines that might be better for that um, sleep disturbance and, and mood. Is there a time when somebody shouldn't be considered for um, uh, hormonal therapy? For example, I'm 56 years old, right? Uh, just taking me, for example. So I've been in menopause for six years. Does that mean then that the closer I get to sort of 60 and, you know, the increased risk, like right now, my uh, being in menopause for six years, of course, the, the risk to for heart disease and osteoporosis goes up and, it's each, and you know, losing muscles uh, by 5%, what is it, a decade or something like that, uh, you know, like, so the, the further I get from menopause, is there a point at which, like, if I went to my doctor, and they might tell me, you know what, you've just, you've just passed this point where, where hormone therapy is safe for you to take or that we wouldn't recommend it for you. Yeah, but it might not only be the age thing. It might be like, how active are you? How's your blood pressure? How's your cholesterol profile? What's your family history? So all that stuff. Some people like that stop, take up heart health. Again, um, like there are tools out there and we can assess where we're at, like in terms of our heart health and our heart risk. It's kind of a deficit-based thing. Um, but I um, think I used, I do that with all of my, clients right and then what can we do to move things into the positive right so um but I wouldn't it's not lifelong anymore we used to think about it like lifelong or you know the um so yeah but the good news is eventually you'll get better and we do have ways of tapering people off hormone therapy too um so that because um if you just stopped it abruptly you're gonna get hot flashes because you have a big change right so you want to um just do a, a gentle slow down yeah. so I still like uh, so that would be if you came to see me I'd be like reviewing okay where are you for your heart health and your breast health and you know how are the symptoms and you know if somebody's just having like the worst time right and then you know it'd be like okay well maybe we can look at trying this for like uh, six months or something like that, right? Like if um, they were doing other healthy things. Mm -hmm. One thing that I did um, yeah. is um, I started running again. So I used to be a runner um, in my uh, teens and I stopped. I think I stopped when I got too busy in medical school. So, but, uh, and it's been really slow and I had back problems. So one time because of sitting in a chair so much, I was like dragging my leg and stuff. I almost needed back surgery, but I tried to do some core exercises instead. So yeah, anyways, cause I've been feeling really tired. The fatigue is real. The fatigue is real. The memory loss is real. We don't talk about that. Like the, and of course, many of us are tired after COVID anyways. Um, but uh, yeah, that's my little thing. Um, and we can't, I'll do that. But um, yeah, I'm slow and it's good. I'm having to learn how to pace myself. I still can't do that very well, um, but I'm getting my weight bearing, right? And it's good for my mood. And of course, um, on my dad's family, the smileys, they all have um, heart um, disease, cardiovascular disease. But I thought I'd 
skip that bullet. Um, but then as soon as I went through menopause, I had high blood pressure, right? So that's, it's just a good thing for me to do. Um, I find it helps um, with the wear and tear um, that I've experienced in this lifetime, helps me stay a bit grounded and it's good for my blood pressure and my mood. And, and I'm bones. weight bearing. And your bones. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cause it's yeah. weight bearing. So, but actually I can, I have to do this run three times a week and then do other cross training, right? Cause uh, then uh, less weight. Mm -hmm. Janet, thank you so much for this, this beautiful evening. Uh, unfortunately, um, I don't think my computer recorded the first part and when, until I got booted off and then Tanya recorded the second part. So if you are tuning into this YouTube, uh, you're going to see an awkward kind of a cut where we come into the into the session midway in conversation. I apologize for that. For some reason, my Wi-Fi just wasn't wasn't up to it. Another thing that I kept thinking about as you were talking, Janet, was um, was, you know, we often say things like, you know, have a conversation with your healthcare provider. And as you pointed out, that's not healthcare providers are not uh, accessible, you know, all the time for people, especially when we're living in some remote, remote northern communities or uh, in situations where you may only have a nurse coming in to your nursing station once a month. Maybe the doctor shows up and he gives you 10 minutes and and that doctor might not have any information on menopause and might not be open to discussing it and so then tomorrow we're going to janet's going to come back and we're going to we're going to tackle um, early onset menopause specifically uh, and all the reasons uh, around why someone might go through early onset menopause uh, how that happens what some of the unique symptoms are and unique challenges are for people who have early onset menopause and uh, we're also going to discuss racism and challenges within the medical health um, field uh, for particularly for Indigenous people uh, around access to care and racism and all those kinds of things. So I will turn over the last word to Tanya and then the last word will go to Janet. Yeah, I just really wanted to thank you for all of the information today. Um, I think that we can go on and on and on about questions about menopause and, and how it um, affects us and what kinds of things that we might try. Um, one of the other things I think that's important um, that we are going to be having a conversation with Lana Whiskey Jack um, at one point is to have to talk about women or people with uteruses organizing in your community to have conversations about it. So that might help um, address issues of access to health care because maybe they're just, you know, you, you, you develop a community and, and you talk about these things and you share what are some of the things working for you and what are some of the things not working for you and just kind of general support. So we really want to um, encourage along the, that thinking as well um, to how can we support each other. And, and of course, um, there will be a point in time when seeking medical attention might be necessary. So the conversation around um, medical racism, I think, is going to be a very important one. Um, hopefully it helps give some suggestions on how to approach your medical professional um, with the questions that you have and, and what you can expect. So I'm really looking forward to that conversation tomorrow. And I just really want to thank you again, Janet, for, for coming on today and I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, thanks everybody for all your questions and for the opportunity. I'm excited because um, like uh, if we can set up these little community discussion groups and then um, I'm only one person, but yeah, just invite me once to your discussion group, have the questions ready and I can try to answer them to the best of my ability or, you know, we just, and, you know, we can identify other Indigenous midwives and um, like uh, nurses, nurse practitioners, and and uh, physicians that could be like a little mobile team, right? So that can have your own discussions and then um, invite us in for that um, clinical session, right? We can build our own skills. So I feel really um, 
motivated about that. So we can talk more about that tomorrow, but thanks so much. Our bodies are awesome. They change and yeah, they don't always, um, yeah, match exactly what we expect of them. Um, but yeah, me, Watson, like, uh, they're complex, amazing, sophisticated, beautiful ecosystems. So we just have to learn more about how they work. So thanks everybody. Have a great night and uh, we'll talk again tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Bye.